13th, St. Charles of Setze, Confessor, First Order. Charles, the son of lowly country folk, was born at Setze in Italy on October 22nd, 1613. At the urgent request of his grandmother, the rearing of the child was entrusted to her, and the gentle boy acquired a great love of God and of prayer from the example and teaching of this devout lady. He grasped the truths of religion so readily that his parents entertained the sweet hope that Charles would later become a priest. But when Charles was old enough to go to school, his studies did not meet with marked success. And so, when his schooling ended, his parents were sensible enough to put him to work in the fields with his brothers. There, in God's free nature, a new light came to the boy. From books he had not learned much, but he came, but he understood very well the wonders of God's creation. Everything conspired to raise his thoughts to heavenly things, so that his work was constantly mingled with interior prayer. He began to receive the sacraments more frequently and evinced real zeal for Christian perfection. Out of veneration for the Virgin Mother of God, he made a vow of chastity at the age of 17, and he preserved it so faithfully that the beloved of pure souls, who feeds among the lilies, seemed to have made his dwelling place in the heart of Charles. He was seized with a great desire for holiness. He read with delight the lives of the saints and related them to the others while at work. In the Franciscan church, which he often visited, he used to study the pictures of the saints with a desire to imitate them. When he was 20 years old, he fell dangerously ill, so that his life was despaired of. Then he made a vow that, if he would recover, he would enter the Franciscan order. At once his illness took a turn for the better, and true to his vow, although there were many hardships to overcome, Charles received the habit two years later. After his consecration to God through the vows, he advanced visibly not only in piety, but in all the virtues of his state of life, so that even the oldest brothers were edified by him and followed his example. He ardently desired to shed his blood for Christ and asked that he might be sent as a lay brother to the missions in India but a new illness frustrated the design. He was sent to a convent in Rome so that he could fully recover his health, but here God Almighty destined him for another field of labor. He received remarkable enlightenment about things divine and about the truths of religion, so that the most learned theologians were astonished at it and consulted with him on some of the most difficult questions. The cardinals and even Pope Clement IX sought his advice. In compliance with the will of God, he also wrote several books about spiritual things. At the same time, the pious brother remained deeply humble. Concerning his remarkable gift of enlightenment, he used to say to himself that our Lord in his wisdom hides such things from the wise, but reveals them to the simple, to which class he belonged. He so fervently adored his Lord under the appearances of bread that one day a ray of light like an arrow went out from the sacred host and impressed a wound in his left side. This wound was still visible after his death. Charles died on January 6, 1670. Pope Leo XII pronounced him blessed in 1882 and Pope John XXIII canonized him in the spring of 1959. On the way to make a meditation. Consider how blessed Charles, who had only a meager understanding of book knowledge, easily grasped the higher knowledge of things divine. From the creature, he advanced to the creator, and from the Creator came the light and the strength necessary for a holy life. Thus he lived in a state of almost constant spiritual meditation, since the latter is nothing more nor less 
than the raising of our thoughts from material things to those that are eternal, to God, and the consequent coming down to us of heavenly enlightenment, stimulation, and fortitude. Meditation is like the mysterious ladder which the patriarch Jacob saw standing upon the earth and the top of it touching heaven, and the angels also of God ascending and descending by it. Genesis 28.12 In order to be able to meditate, it is not necessary to have great knowledge. It suffices to have a heart that does not cling to material things, but delights in raising itself to God. That, however, is the first requisite for meditation. How do you stand in this respect? <clears throat> During meditation, some souls are led by God himself, as was blessed Charles. Such souls need no instruction. But most souls must follow a special order so that their minds will not wander about aimlessly. In order to meditate, we first imagine ourselves quite vividly in the presence of God and beseech God for his aid. Then we read the points of the meditation, to which end also these considerations may serve, or we call to mind a mystery in the life and suffering of Christ. From the mystery, we seek to draw a lesson for ourselves in about the form that we would communicate it to another person, or as we would wish to have observed it at the end of our life. Then we reflect on our own past transgressions against it, sincerely repent of them, make definite resolutions for the future, and pray God to grant us the help of his grace. Have your meditations perhaps often been poor because you did not observe some such order as this? Consider how a person should conduct himself during meditation in times of aridity and dryness of heart. Sometimes this is a trial from heaven. At such times, let the person make stronger efforts to collect his thoughts, and by means of prayers of supplication, call on God and the saints, much as a gardener, when rain does not fall from heaven, himself sprinkles or has others sprinkle. Sometimes aridity is caused through our own fault, because we do not utilize the graces given us and do not derive fruit from past meditations or because we allow our hearts to be occupied throughout the day with all kinds of strange and distracting thoughts and disorderly inclinations. Such distraction will disturb our meditation too. A vessel will for a long time smell of what it once contained. In future, therefore, endeavor through the day to keep your thoughts collected while you are occupied with the duties imposed upon you. Keep occupied with the resolutions of your last meditation and with God, in order to love him more. The more you love God, the easier it will be for your heart to rise to him during meditation. Prayer of the Church O Lord Jesus Christ, who didst marvelously wound the heart of blessed Charles, with a dart from thy most sacred body. Through his intercession, look graciously down upon us, and in thy goodness enkindle in our hearts the fire of thy love, who livest and reignest forever and ever. Amen. St. Charles of Setze, pray for us. Thank you.